design it and, and have helped set all the chairs up with the food and everything like that. Um, I also want to thank a couple of people for their mentorship and support of the Race and Pedagogy Working Group. Um, Tracy Matthews at the Center for the Study of Race, Pedagogy, and Cult Politics and Culture. <laughs> um, Selena Chapman Nelson at UC Chicago Grad Diversity and Development. And uh, Cheryl Richardson at the Chicago Center for Teaching. Um, Camille Morgan and Alyssa Rodriguez have also um, lent their logistical and artistic support. Alyssa is also manning the video camera today. Thank you for that. Uh, and this event was also, is also made possible by the financial support of the Office of the Focus. Um, there's also, I, just, I also want to plug um, an upcoming Race and Pedagogy, another Race and Pedagogy Working Group event. It's called Teaching Race and Visual Culture. And I believe it's scheduled for May, May 21st, the afternoon of May 21st. Um, location. Okay, next time, uh, TBA, and it's going to be held at the Sport Museum um, in the galleries, and it's a chance to learn about how to teach race and visual culture together, actually working with objects. Yeah, so please come on for that one as well. Um, so um, I'll just briefly go over the order of the day, the agenda we have for today, um, welcome and acknowledgments, I already did that. Um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction, kind of just give background for the panel, you know, why this felt like a worthwhile thing to do. Um, and then we're going to hear opening statements from, from Adam and Yasmin, uh, followed by a 15-20 minute conversation among the three of us. Um, I get to do that because I invited them here. Um, and then we'll open it up for kind of a 30-40 minute um, audience Q&A and discussion um, at the very end. And if, if necessary, I, I'll take stack for that. Um, so just a little bit about um, the background for the panel. Um, the starting point for us is to question the mantra, my teaching is my activism. Right? So um, we want to account for the conjunction between teaching and activism, and to think of the ways that these two occupy spaces together in, in academia, and how we make them occupy the same place, um, the same, uh, but also the same, the same bodies, the same careers, um, our, our, our bodies as teachers. I think it's important to note that we're conceiving teaching in its broad sense that encompasses not just our labor in the classroom, but also our scholarly work in research, uh, publishing, etc. So on the one hand, we want to take seriously the challenge that activism might pose to teaching, uh, such that perhaps if maybe my teaching isn't my activism, or cannot be my activism. Maybe teaching is one thing and activism is another. And maybe action takes different kinds of literacy, different spaces, different social networks, and different effective orientations, yada, yada, yada. So how do we manage or, or bridge that gap? So that's one thing. But on the other hand, we also want to explore how our teaching is or can actually be our activism. So we want to take that possibility seriously, that our teaching is our activism, and what that actually means. Um, there's this folk wisdom that says that academia is the opposite thing from direct action. I think that this is embodied in the whole metaphor of the ivory tower, right? Um, so this idea that academia produces this kind of solipsistic discourse that is somehow completely separate from, from direct action or that, or that um, academic discourse fails to have some kind of substantive impact in the larger world. And, you know, I, th I think at many levels for this panel, we'll just presume, I think, that that's obviously not true. That academia is always a form of direct action upon the world, upon ourselves, our colleagues, our students, our neighbors even if in ways that we might not necessarily desire. So then the question becomes, how do we do it so that um, the direct action that comes from, from academic work is, is towards the direction that, that we want it to be? Uh, so the basic goals for today, just to reiterate, uh, first, if we do want to say that research and teaching are our activism, then what do we mean by that? And how do we account for the kind of broad, substantive, pedagogical impact that we envision? And second, if we take seriously the possibility that there exist structural limitations and constraints on teaching, or academic labor construed broadly, that prevent an easy equal sign between teaching on the one hand and activism on the other, then what do we do about that when we want as individuals and as a community to bridge that gap? So now I'm going to introduce our speakers. I, you know, let's, I'm, I'm going to just read out their bios back to back and we can just for both of them at the same time after. <laughs> um, so uh, to my, directly to my right is Adam Getachew. Um, Adam, Adam is a Neubauer Assistant Professor of Political Science at the College at the University of Chicago. Her research interests are situated in the history of political thought with a focus on international law, theories of empire and race, black political thought, and post-colonial political theory. Her current book project, 
world-making after empire, the rise and fall of self-determination, reconstructs an account of self-determination offered in the political thought of black Atlantic anti-colonial nationalists during the height of decolonization in the 20th century. African American Studies from Yale University and the BA in Politics and African American Studies from the University of Virginia. Um, over to the right is Yasmin Nair. Uh, Yasmin is an academic activist and writer based in Hyde Park whose work often considers the state of academe today. The growth and presence of social media, queer and LGBTQ issues, and more broadly, the slow and fast devastation of neoliberalism. She is a co-founder of the Radical Queer Editorial Collective Against Equality, a member of the radical queer organization Gender Just, and an editor at large at Current Affairs. Nair is working on a book project entitled Strange Love, The Invention of Social Justice. Her work has appeared in anthologies and publications like The Baffler, Current Affairs, In These Times, Vox, Windy City, Times, and several other places. The work can be found at www.yasmeennair.net. Her recent publications include A Manifesto, published in Evergreen Review, and Exalted Slogans, The Curse of Radical Academic Discourse, just fresh out um, in The Baffler. Um, I, I want to bring my copy, but I left it at home. All right, so let's please welcome our, our two speakers. Okay, well, thank you all for being here, um, and I'm looking forward to the exchange and to the conversation. So. Um, I guess to open, I wanted to say a bit about my own intellectual and political trajectory and then offer a preliminary um, answer to the question, is my teaching my activism? So um, as the bio kind of, kind of made clear, um, I come out of um, African American studies and I imagine that to be the site of both my kind of intellectual and political formation. Um, so as an undergraduate um, major in African American studies, one piece that I read that I returned to over and over again was this article by Vincent Harding called The Vocation of the Black Scholar. Um, uh, Vincent Harding was a kind of religious studies scholar, but was involved in this formation in Atlanta called the Institute of the Black World, which was a formation of kind of around um, uh, HBCUs in, at at, in Atlanta that often brought in a variety of speakers. So C.L.R. James gave his famous lectures on, on black Jacobins in the 1970s at IBW, Walter Rodney, a variety of kind of black radical actors passed through that space. Um, so this article in some ways, you know, it, it um, emerged in the context of the formation of African American studies as a field, um, as an intellectual project that obviously was came out of um, the civil rights movement and black power. And the claim was that uh, black scholars, black academics had a particular kind of role to play in the institution and in the academy. Um, one, an intellectual one about kind of rethinking um, you know, Eurocentric curricula. Um, an institutional one about thinking about the relationship between the institution and uh, the cities, the places, etc., that those institutions inhabit. Um, and then a kind of broader political responsibility to the to the movement, um, the black power movement of its time. So this is the kind of like, this is the thing that led me to graduate school in some ways. This is the thing I thought I was doing when I got a PhD. Um, and, and I think like on the one hand, some of, I'll say how some of this has remained with me and how I've had also had to rethink a variety of, of the, um, the form formulations of that essay. So, you know, as I said, so I went into a PhD in African American studies and in political science. And, you know, I think one thing to think about, I guess, is we also occupy a very elite institution, but what the institutionalization of African American studies did to that particular configuration of politics and intellectual projects. So as, as African American studies, as women's studies increasingly became institutionalized in the academy, it took on the various formations that other disciplines had. Um, so this kind of argument or claim about the relationship between African American studies and, and whatever our political commitments were beyond the institution were for me actually, I found it very difficult to make those arguments and my colleagues found it very difficult to make those arguments within the space of African American studies at Yale. Um, 
And in fact, for a variety of reasons, those kinds of conversations were actually rejected and resisted, right? That, you know, there was a maybe, maybe a politics of respectability, maybe something else about how we had to kind of conform and perform the particular ways in which one had to be an academic and one had to be an intellectual. Um, and, but I think at the same time, I found alternative spaces uh, that were thinking about, uh, about what it meant to be a political intellectual or what it meant to participate in uh, politics. And for me, at least in my time at, in graduate school, that came in the form of union politics. Um, I was involved in the effort to unionize graduate students, which was part of a formation um, that involved other kinds of other campus workers, uh, clerical and technical workers, dining hall workers, and had a community organizing component as well. Um, so I think for me in that moment, I began to, th to think very um, seriously about the ways in which potentially there were disjunctures between the intellectual work I was doing, uh, which I think is valuable for a variety of reasons, um, and, and what, what the political work that I was trying to do. And, um, and they, they, the, I think the connection between them for me and remains for me is that I, was, that, that I was positioned within the academy, right? And so that's what allowed me to be an academic, but it was also the thing that allowed me to raise certain kinds of questions about uh, the politics of the institution, both internally and in relationship uh, to the city of New Haven at the time. So, so for instance, like, you know, I'll g give one example about how this might work. So, I mean, we're all very familiar, I think, here and in, um, across all institutions about the language of diversity, right? Like every institution is rhetorically committed to, the, to a claim about diversity and representation within the institution. But it's like, what does that concretely mean? What could that concretely mean in a city, for instance, or in a neighborhood that's predominantly black, right? In, in a, a majority white institution um, is, is situated in that. And so that became for me, say, one place to think about a different kind of language of equity that uh, both, both thought about like what it meant to um, diversify the faculty, right? Or to diversify the graduate student body but that thought seriously also about what kinds of like forms of access and inclusion uh, would be required to address the kind of hierarchies and inequalities that structure the relationship between the institution and um, and uh, the and, and the community around it. So, I guess I guess what I would say, I mean, to give like a preliminary answer to the is the is teaching my activism. I think. I would say no, <laughs> I mean, ultimately. I think teaching is political, right? It, it's as all relations are, and they're political for a variety of reasons. We have to think about who it is that gets to occupy our classrooms, right? How it is that they end up there and not, not other people. Uh, we have to think about the political economy of the academy, right? The ways in which um, uh, increasingly tenure track jobs are no longer you know, the norm, 70% um, of jobs in the academy are, you know, adjunct, casualized labor. And so um, it's an in inherently political kind of relationship. Uh, who gets to occupy the classroom, in what, uh, in what me modes they get to do that. Um, um, you know, what we decide to teach is a political question, right? Um, when we teach, uh, you know, this is a constant conversation here around the core, right? Like when we teach classics of social and political thought, do we, who do we teach, right? And, and even when we think about uh, expanding the canon, who are the figures we turn to to do that work of expansion, right? And so, um, so that, and then finally, how we <coughs> teach um, is also a kind of political question, right? What forms of pedagogy do we engage in? And so I think there's a difference between things being political and then being kind of forms of activism or forms of organi organizing. And so, um, so I think those are these are inherently political questions. Um, but I think the like, you know, limiting um, or collapsing the dis the distinction between teaching and teaching and research and activism. Um, I think it, it, it's a. I think it's a dangerous. Uh, it's a. It can be potentially a dangerous slippage. One because I think um, it. 
it's it's it disavows our political responsibility as political actors who inhabit various kinds of spaces, right? Just because I teach a black political thought class does not mean that I'm like doing anything in the world to make that vision of the world realizable. And I think to simply say that my teaching this class is a political act and it, and, it's, and a sufficient political act or an activist, an, a form of activism, kind of, it's a way of avoiding, I think, the question of like, what are we doing about <laughs> the forms of inequality and hierarchy that structure our world um, and that the university is actively part a participant in. Um, so I think so. I think that's one. I think the other is, you know, um, I think about this a lot. I mean, I think of politics and political action as a collective project and one in which um, we, you know, um, we do with our peers, right? We do in collective forms. and. You know, I think teaching can be that, but teaching is also a space of hi inherent hierarchy, right? There's a teacher, there are students, and and even as, as we think about the ways in which we can transform that, I think it's basic, the basic premise of that relationship is there. And so the forms of activism or organizing I've been involved in are ones that kind of constantly call that kind of hierarchy into question that ask us to be in relation with each other in a different kind of way. Um, and and that, so a kind of more horizontal relationship between all of us who are engaged in a particular kind of collective project, a political project. And so I think those make, you know, um, activism, or like organizing and activism slightly different from the act of teaching. Um, but I think, you know, one, I, I mean, the things I think that, that have remained from my earlier kind of um, formation is the sense in which that I think as academics um, um, and graduate students, we do have the very, I think, a very dis important responsibility to think about how our institutions uh, relate to the broader world. So this is not an argument that we kind of we should do our intellectual work in these silos in which um, we're not engaged in you know, the world out there because in some ways the world in here reproduces that world out there and, and the things that are happening in these institutions are shaping those things out there, right? So, um, I think, so I think we have a very distinctive kind of responsibility to ask to ask to to, call, to, call, uh, to hold our institutions are into account, and I think that c there can be that kind of political organizing and activism that exists alongside um, our intellectual work. Um, maybe I'll just I'll leave it at that for now, and then um, I can say more in the conversation. Thank you, Thank you everyone coming out. Uh, thank you to the center for this wonderful space and uh, I also want to thank everyone who was involved in bringing this together, especially those in the Race and Pedagogy Working Group. Um, I have some experience with organizing events, so it's always um, not always the smoothest thing, but uh, so thank you for doing this. I've interacted, I've met Chaz, of course, and I've interacted with him a number of times. Um, there are others I only know by name. Actually, I just, I, I did meet them today. Aylin and Amanda, thank you everyone for organizing. I, I keep saying that because, again, I organize a lot of events, and I just feel like, oh my God, this is so much work. Thank you for that. Um, but over and above that, this is also actually about institutional power. Uh, which is why I'm going to such lengths to thank people. It's about the redistribution of money, it's about the redistribution of resources, it's about making sure people are fed at a very awkward time of the day uh, when they've been rushing in and out, uh, out, uh, out of buildings and trying to get to meetings and so on. Um, so I think all of that really matters. Um, I also know that a lot of these events happen in ways that we don't see because so much of the work that happens happens invisibly, it happens behind the scenes. Uh, for instance, I don't know who made this amazing poster that advertises the event. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and so, you know, I just always try to make that sort of apparent, uh, that sort of structure really clear. Um, I'm also here echoing Stuart Hall's extremely fond and loving characterization, 
some years ago, and I think I am misquoting him, but I'll just sort of uh, paraphrase where he referred to women of color in academia in particular, especially those who were doing post-colonial colonial studies, what was then still uh, just a beginning field, he said, you know, what they've done is they've come up on the table of academia and they've crapped all over it. So I've always been fond, you know, I've always been happy to be in some ways uh, included, I hope, I think, and I'll explain what my academic lineage is. Uh, but I've always liked the idea of, you know, women of color crapping on the table. So I am here, and I'm fond of metaphors, and you'll see metaphors tend to collide in my work. Um, so, but I'm also here in that sense to pee on the rug, a chance to leave a turd in the fruit punch, pee on the table, etc., etc. What I want to do today is not so much talk about how we, you know, or the sort of collective we, and I think we're all questioning the we-ness of the situation, and I think we all have a very good sense that, yes, all of this is usually complicated, uh, there are no easy ways to think about the solution, but we're here to see, I think partly, what can we do to move forward, right, in this very fractured time of academia, and how do we, to be honest, right, how do we gain support uh, from each other, because this is a horrible time. And I don't mean Trump, by the way. Trump was an inevitability, Trump is a symptom. So I'm not talking about Trump, and I think we all know that, but I just want to articulate that. I want to say that academia, in, in particular, is in a fraught period of time. And I say that as someone who actually, for all her critiques, and I critique academia a lot, I'm actually deeply invested in academia for various reasons. I'm invested in So, um, as we think about you know, how we go about a high-minded work of apparently marrying academic and activist work, I also want to talk about three things in particular, perhaps not in equal proportion, but I want to just foreground all of them. Money, sex, and power. Right? I want to talk about money, sex, and power because in academia we're not encouraged. And outside academia, we're not encouraged to think about academia in terms of money, sex, and power. Whereas that is, those are the three things that actually structure um, our lives. Um, I'm also here as a scholar academic, and I'm not making fun of chairs or anyone else for that, but I'm always amused by how people just don't know quite how to relate to me. Um, and, in, and I'm in an institution, the University of Chicago. I live in Hyde Park. I'm going to, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> I live in a, I keep forgetting. Oh, this is being recorded. So I live in a, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a neighborhood which keeps referring to itself as a town, uh, and. I live in, you know, we all live in what I often refer to as a combination of a company town and a military installation, right? So yeah. that has been really fascinating to actually live in the kind of institution that I've always been theorizing for a long time. So that's been fascinating. But I'm here today at the University of Chicago in an institution which is, I suspect, uh, often as, as, as a person who is, I think, often an object of curiosity as a scholar or academic. Sometimes of envy, sometimes of hostility, and often, let us be blunt, sheer contempt. Right? I understand all of that. Um, it is not rare for me to be in such, situ such situations. I sometimes feel like a trick pony at these, you know, in these, uh, at these events. And again, Chad and the others have been wonderful. But it's always fascinating to watch academics interact uh, with me. I recently watched Isle of Dogs. I don't know how many of you have seen that. Uh, Oh, no one. Good God. <laughs> okay. uh, Wes Anderson film, I don't really care for his human films. The films that he does about animals are always actually really interesting. But in this one, you know, Scarlett Johansson plays this really beautiful show dog, a uh, really beautiful blonde show dog, and this other mutt dog looks at her and says, so do you do any tricks, you know, as a show dog, as an ex-show dog? And she so she sort of throws herself on her front legs, kicks up her hind legs, and starts paddling them upside down, and she says, you have to imagine that I'm balancing and juggling a nine pound bowling ball while I do this. And he says, looks at him and says, oh yeah, I can see that. And then this hot bubble above his head appears, showing her doing that, right? So as I speak to you today, I'm only gonna be sitting behind this desk, but I want you to imagine, right, that as a scholar academic, this is my trick for the day, what my friends and I are actually doing is to demolish racism, misogyny, and capitalism as I speak. So you just have to imagine me <laughs> doing all of that in the work, you know, that I haven't, I haven't brought PowerPoints or anything, but you just have to believe it, right? This is what we do. So, I'm 
our question for today is, is our teaching our activism? The short answer, I agree, is no. The longer answer is also no, but it's no for about the next 10 minutes. And I'll drag it out to tell you why, why it's no. So, but to give you a short background of who I am, I graduated with a PhD in 2000. My degree is in English. I specialized, as all the cool people at the time, this was 2000, as all the cool people at the time did, I graduated in critical theory with a concentration in film and media studies. Um, I was an adjunct for three years at UIC. I actually moved to Chicago. I graduated in <coughs> Chicago in 1997 because I didn't feel I was being politically and academic, not academically, I wasn't being politically challenged. I had recently come out as queer, recently-ish come out as queer, and I wasn't finding queer radical politics. It was all very much moving towards marriage, etc. So I moved to Chicago, not knowing anyone, but I think two people. Um, and the short version of my activism in terms of the groups I joined, I joined a, a group called Kuli Zaban, uh, which was a South Asian queer group, not particularly political, more of a social group. Um, and then I joined Queer to the Left, um, which was actually, that did some interesting work. It's now being resurrected as some sort of grand anti-neoliberal gay group, but it did end up as a marriage group, um, as all queer groups did at the time, right? I mean, it was just sort of an inevitability at the time, apparently. Um, and then, you know, it also became a group that was dominated by white gay men obsessed with gay marriage. So as, when I left, I was the last of my kind. A friend of mine, a white male, a gay male, looked at me and says, you know, with you, losing you, we just lost three of our constituencies. <laughs> so, um, I just left to the boys. Um, and today I'm a member of, um, yes, I'm a co-founder of Against Equality. We are only five of us. We make it look really large. I'm also a member of Gender Just. We are also approximately five to 12, seven of us on a good day. We are having an event on June 5. Uh, shameless plug here, we're doing a, a, kicking off a series of events on blackness, queerness, and criminalization. Uh, if, you, if you want any more details about that, uh, let me know. I call myself an academic, sometimes to the dismay of many people who are formally academic, right? So a few years ago, I was at a conference or something, and a woman said, so you call yourself an academic, yes? But which institution? I'm an academic. And it was really distressing. I could tell that she was profoundly distressed by this idea, right? That I was calling myself an academic, but did not have anything resembling an academic affiliation. I had by then uh, left um, being an adjunct. Um, but you know, all, that, all of that being said, let me just say this first of all, and I want to put this up front, is that um, getting a PhD, right? Getting my PhD was the best and most fulfilling thing I ever did. It was a horrible experience for a while, I'll tell you about that in a while, but it was fabulous. And I want to say that up front because I think right now there's a strong movement of anti-intellectualism, especially in the so-called left, especially in academia, where a lot of people are feeling really apologetic about, oh, you know, I'm in academia, I'm so sorry, I must apologize for my existence. Getting a PhD was a fantastic thing, right? I loved it. I loved the research. I loved everything. It was also hell. I mean, if it had not been for my wonderful advisor and now dear friend, Joe Palmer, I literally would not be standing in front of you today. And as dire as that sounds, I will leave that for you to think about. All that being said, getting a PhD, right, and granting <coughs> PhDs is not the problem. The institutions granting the degree degrees can be the problem. The, frankly, assholes who populate these institutions and often ruin things for students are the problem, right? So I think we really have to think about what is academia about? What are the real problems? Who's really creating all these problems? What does academic work mean? What does activism mean? Um, you know, and to the question about does your teaching have to be your activism, here's what I will say, and you know, incongruence with Adam is your teaching needs to be your teaching, and you need to know how to do it well. And what that well means, I think, is something that we can explore uh, today. I'll talk more about this at the end. Um, you know, and today I am sort of out of academia technically, but I have a lot of friends who are still in it, who are on the job market. I see a lot of what they go through. I understand the tensions. I'm seeing all the conversations. Um, and I think in some ways, it's, it's more open to difficult conversations, but it's also more likely, I think, to have a lot of difficult conversations shut down in the name of radicalism. So today, you know, I think the question for me has been, uh, people often ask, well, so what do you do? How do you survive? How are you such a success? And 
you know, I'm not sure I'm a success. I make ends meet, not a living, but I make ends meet with a series of gigs that include being a personal assistant and housekeeper. I've become really good uh, at the housekeeping stuff. I used to be a semi hoarder, and now you can give me a really untidy room and I can have it looking like Drake in 48 hours. So that's like, I feel like that's a life skill I've acquired along the way. You know, I'm fortunate as well to have very generous and kind supporters and friends who make things happen. Uh, when they need to. Um, and I left academia formally in terms of institutional affiliation in 2003. The question is, of course, why? I had been among the first Lord of Adjuncts to be hired on year-long contracts at UIC. My contract was renewed twice. It wasn't the third time. These things happen. I was pretty much told, well, you know, we're waiting for the next blah, 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 and you can probably come back if you want to, etc., etc. I decided to take myself off the list. And this is not me saying, oh, I left, my, I'm not in, involved in legal tussle, I'm not trying to say, I'm the one who left academia. It's sort of, you know, eh, you know what, I can't get any writing time, I'm teaching three classes, I came into this field to write and to do research and to think, and I'm not able to do that because I'm teaching three classes a semester. So, um, I left. Um, and I don't really ever want, again, to be a professor or a teacher or in front of a classroom for anything unless it's for a guest lecture or a presentation like this, or some sort of visiting gig where I sit you know, in the back and I nod and smile sagely like the wise person who's been called it. I have no interest otherwise in actually gaining a tenure track, tenure, any kind of formal position in academia. I bring that up, again, not to be egotistical about it, but because one of the things that happens when you are someone like me that you kind of, you know, you, you sort of figure out that people are saying things about you, the kind of third personness that comes about when you've been writing as much as I have. And I know that a lot of people, a lot of the work that I read and respond to is the work of academics writing about matters like gay marriage, for instance. And I know that there is more than a rumor that my critiques of such topics have everything to do with the with the idea that I am apparently a disgruntled academic, furious and angry at never having gained a tenure track position. Right? I know that's one of the stories that circulates about me. We can talk in the Q&A session about why I don't want a tenure track position, but for now, I want to raise this point because in the vein of pissing on the table, I'm not just trying to be you know, telling you, hey, this is who I am personally, but I, because I want to disrupt a fundamental myth that academics hold on to so tenaciously that everyone is really trying to get it, right? I want to disrupt that myth. It's really difficult for academics to understand that some of us do academic work in academic ways and have yet no, absolutely no desire to be formal academics. At the same time, and I cannot emphasize this enough, I have a deep and abiding respect for academic work. Um, and I'm not among those. I am not among those who thinks that academia needs to be raised to the ground. I have very little patience with that, with that particular a lot of people. We can also discuss that later. So I want to get to the sex part. Um, as you can tell, the segues here are sometimes non-existent. But let's get to the sex part. <laughs> so I, just, I want to just sort of you know, give out a couple of points and then we can pick up in the question and answer session, in the discussion, etc. To the sex part. We're in the midst of what some call a Me Too movement. I have a hard time with thinking of it as a movement, but whatever. And academia is part of, the, is part of that. Given the tide of accusations against many, many academics, many of whom happen to be, surprise, on the left, right? This is a fraught time, culturally, intellectually, politically, academically. There are accusations not being, when I was, you know, when I came to this country in the 80s, late 80s, 89, 90s, and so on, um, all the accusations were about extreme right-wing men, and we knew exactly how to respond to all of that. Ah, of course, these, you know, these horrible, whatever, you know, right-wing Christians, Mormons, they have all these sex scandals. We have no idea how to grapple with the fact that right now we're, fa we're talking about accusations against mostly men on the left. You know. And I, you know, left, even broadly speaking, we're talking about liberal Hollywood to left, left, left at academic and other journals. And I did not think that I could come to the University of Chicago and not address at least one or two of the kinds of accusations that are being made here, including, for instance, those leveled at Deepesh Chakraborty, who is one of the founders, one of the key figures um, in a field of work very closely connected to something that I studied a lot in graduate school. Right, so it's sort of that that part of it is also sort of bizarre. I'm not interested in adju adjudicating guilt or innocence here. 
or even in assuming that matters can be uncomplicated. Um, but you know, there's, there, are mat, there are issues around these situations, right, which have to do with money, sex, and power. And I think one of the big issues, if we want to talk about academia and activism, we cannot do that if we are not going to confront how power works in these situations. So when you talk about Harvey Weinstein, yes, you can say, of course, and here's, you know, this, you know, white man with literally millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. You can easily define, right, how money and power and sex work in those situations. It's much harder to define it in academia, where, for instance, one person or two people, you know, husband and wife, for instance, can actually dictate what a field will look like for possibly two to three decades, right? It's not like a corporate job where you can get rid of one person and you have, you know, HR come in and change all the rules and everyone signs different documents for six months, etc. And everyone sits in front of a TV, you know, a video that tells you how not to sexually assault someone, right? <laughs> That's not how it works in academia. We all know this. The invisibility, right, of the power structure, the invisibility of the sexualization of the power structure is something we don't talk about. And there is no way in hell that I could have come in here and talked about academia and activism and not brought all of that up to the forefront, especially because I understand that it's become very difficult to talk about it within institutions. I, on the other hand, can come in as I said and piss on the table. I read Uri Kumbat's uh, piece in the Maroon about this. She's, I think she's an undergraduate student. And you know, while I'm not the sort who thinks that every, every person, you know, I, I'm not in a, the sort who says that all women should be believed, etc., etc. Again, you know, there are complicated conversations to be had around that. But I do think, and I don't, you know, and I'm also, some of you know this, I'm not for trigger warnings, which is a delicate way of saying I'm completely against them. But, but at the same time, I do think the university has certain responsibilities, right? So when Urvi um, writes um, in her piece in the Maroon, she writes she writes about trying to figure out whether or not she should take a class with Deepesh Chakrabarti, right? And she says, I don't know what to do, and I don't think I can because of all these different factors. And do and it wasn't just about safety, right? It was about whom, who's to whom are my commitments, right? Are my commitments to the women who have made an accusation and who have not been responded to at all? Or do I just go ahead and talk, you know, go further in, in my own career? And she writes, I shouldn't have to make decisions like that simply in order to get an education. It's you of Chicago's duty to make me feel secure in a learning environment. And I think, you know, I'm just gonna leave that sort of quote out there because I think we really need to think long and hard about all the different aspects of what that means. What does learning environment mean? So what does that mean in relation to activism and academia? What, is, what does getting an education mean, right? What does a university's duty mean, et cetera? Um, you know, in terms of political identifications, I'm on the left, I'm queer. I'm on the, I feel sometimes I feel like I'm one of the last people who identifies as Marxist, but maybe not. Everyone's a socialist these days. But you know, I'm sort of old fashioned. I'm on the left, I'm queer. I don't really know what that means these days in terms of queerness other than, you know, I'm, it's obviously not just about sexual orientation. I don't know if it's just a security blanket because I came of age in the 90s in you know, in the heyday of queer theory. I don't know. But I am a feminist. I take that very, very seriously. And I know what feminism means. It means thinking about how women and those gendered as women, whether they're straight, queer, cis, trans, male, right? So people who are gendered as women in particular situations bear the brunt of institutional silencing and oppression. So for me, feminism is also an economic matter, right? It's about disabling women's access to opportunity. It's, you know, so I'm very firmly, for instance, for abortion rights no matter what. That's just a hard line. I'm in favor of a litmus test for left politics. I'm, I'm okay with that, right? So, but yeah, what, uh, what does, the, the, the questions around intimacy, the questions around power, sex, um, how is all of that related? We cannot talk about the relationship between academia and activism as if these sorts of quotidian matters, right? Uh, what is the environment for students like? What do the professor say as he handed back the paper? We, can, we have to address those directly. We can't pretend that they don't exist or should not exist. Which is to say uh, that ultimately, as much as I like academia, as much as I like being on the left, academia and the left are both, frankly, steaming piles of racism and misogyny, right? That is the, uh, that, that is the other reality that we have to confront, that neither place, academia nor activism on the left, 
uh, are actually in any way. We know this, but we, I don't think we really confront it, right? And we've always been told over and over again, every time there's a revolution of any sort, we're told, yes, 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 I know, this is a problem. This racism is a problem, the sexism is a problem, but we've got to get to the goal. Let's get, let's get to the goal, let's get the revolution going, and then we'll come back and think about all of you, right? So that's always been the case, and that just really needs to stop. Um, so in terms of the links between activism and academia, um, I think that there's a tendency to be fetishistic on both sides. I think academics tend to fetishize act activists as somehow more authentic. Um, and activists tend to fetishize academics as somehow knowing more. There's also, and again, I'll just throw this out very broadly, there's a long link between the nonprofit industrial complex and academia, right? So that also needs to be considered in terms of that relationship between how how that relationship between activism and academia works out. Uh, and I, you know, want to say there's a, there's a way in which, I think one of the questions we were posed was how do we think about academia and academic work uh, and analysis in activism. But I, what I want to point to today is one example especially, I want to turn that on its head and I want to point out that activism is a kind of ad analysis in its own way. And sometimes hiding how it's analysis is deeply harmful to movements, right? So the best example I have for you is, and especially relevant to those of us in Chicago, is of the undocumented movement, the, which is sometimes known as the undocumented queer movement. Mostly students uh, started about, I would say, f about, about a decade ago. I was there at the very beginning. I was one of the first people to report on it. Um, the undocumented queer movement basically is all about people coming out as undocumented, right? Um, and a lot of us who saw this coming about objected to this kind of wholesale coming out movement because we kept saying, you know, this is actually a problem. You're asking millions of young undocumented people and older people as well to basically, quote unquote, come out of the shadows. The shadows actually are what keep a lot of people safe. And then, of course, with the undocumented movement, we saw the push for DACA, which is deferred um, action for childhood arrivals, which again, required people to come out, show their papers so that they could get temporary papers. But, you know, on the face of it, it looked like a good thing. A lot of us were saying, this is a problem because DACA is not legislation. DACA is merely a presidential executive order, which means DACA can be subverted any day by the next Democrat president or, ta-da. Right? What you have now are millions of people who have been pushed out into the sunlight and are left completely vulnerable. Um, so, but when we were objecting to all of this, what we were told, those of us, you know, in gender just, in moratoriums so on deportations, a lot of radical immigration groups, we were constantly told, you guys are just being the, you know, you're just being elitist academic snobs. You're, you're giving us analysis. We're doing real action. So we saw all these actions, and I, some of you might remember those, you know, cameras everywhere outside prisons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, all of them standing somberly around in their caps and gowns, uh, being photographed. Look how how radical this is, they're all getting arrested. I can tell you as someone who was inside some of those campaigns, most of the arrests were complete bullshit uh, because they were actually fake arrests, it's a long story. But more importantly, that was the kind of, that was the um, demarcation, right? Analysis versus authentic action. But that was actually analysis. That was people sitting down in a room and saying, if we do this, we are doing, we're going to do this because this is what will inspire people to have sympathy for our cause. That's not just authentic action. That is deep analysis, right? But they were able to get away with blaming us as the people who were just doing analysis and critique. So I just want to point out that even that whole idea of you know, what, is, what is authentic, what is analysis versus what is action is sort of problematic. Um, so, you know, I don't want to take up more time. I'll just talk very quickly about hand cream and um, hand cream and The Walking Dead. Or maybe I won't. I'll talk about that later. All I will say is that a great revolution needs hand cream, excellent hand cream. And what I mean by that is the left and activists in particular have a really bad tendency to always talk about everything as if every, everyone needs to wear a hair shirt, right? We've all decided that when the revolution comes, we're all going to be giving up all our pleasures. We're going to be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not indulging ourselves. And I want the kind, you know, I always say my revolution is lots of sushi 
and the kind of hand cream that makes you think you never need sex again, right? So I just want to say, you know, in terms of political analysis and what activ activists and academics can do, I just want to throw this out there. Fight for really good hand cream. Fight for a better world. Fight for great hand cream. Uh, Walking Dead, I just wanted to bring that in because, again, I think there's a tendency, uh, there's a tendency to assume that things are so much better because we have all these academics writing about popular cultural texts and isn't it amazing? It's actually awful. So that's one of the, I think, like, so much of the academics writing about, uh, say, Walking Dead or anything, it, there's, there's this kind of long ripple effect that's happened, right, where because so many academics are now writing, often for free, scabbing, are now writing for popular magazines, they have a tendency to make everything seem much more portentous than it needs to be. So I was watch so I watched uh, Lost in Space, which used to be a 1960s campy show, and it's just been redone on Netflix in like 10 episodes. And it was fine. It's designed for 12-year-olds. But all these complaints were from these sort of academic -y critics who said, it's not campy enough, or it's just not thoughtful. Hannah Arendt. Right? <laughs> it's okay to watch a silly show. You know, it's not even silly. It's like a fun, well-made show about people lost in space. What more do you want to binge upon over the course of a weekend, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is that I think you know that it's not a good thing that academics are writing for more quote of good popular magazines and such. It really isn't. And we need to think about how we're actually ruining discourse and we're ruining we're ruining pleasure. Right. So, in terms of you know how to survive, um, I talk to a lot of my friends about how to survive, you know, academia. Be because I think I, I want everyone to be able to survive, right? I want everyone to be able to actually continue in academia. How do we do that? We do that, of course, yes, by organizing and so on, so on. But we also, I think, we have to figure out how not to replicate horrible patterns, right? So one of the things I always say, whether in academia or in activism, is when something horrible happens to you, when someone horrible does something terrible to you. Say to yourself, this is what I will never do to anyone else. I will never do this to my students. I will never do this to my, you know, whoever works under me in a nonprofit. I will never do this. Should be the second thing you say to yourself after, you know, I will kill them and make them pay. Um, but the second thing you should say is, I will never do this to anyone else, right? So that's something just to remember because I think academia in particular sort of recycles its traumas in weird ways. You know, I've, I've so often you will hear professors saying, Well, I'm not going to tell you this because I had to go through it, so you should suffer. And it's just a very strange thing. Um, you know, don't be a smug asshole if you're an academic and you enter an activist space. You know, don't act like you know everything, etc., etc. Those are sort of things that we should all know, but unfortunately, as I know too well from organizing for many, many years, it is not the case. Mostly, I think we need to keep thinking about utopias as whether we think about it from an academic perspective or from an activist perspective. I think we need to keep thinking about utopias. And I think our utopias need to integrate intellectual work, right? So my utopia, and I actually have written about a utopia, which I think everyone should read, she said shamelessly, but, you know, in my utopia, right, is one where intellectual work is not separate from the world in general, right? So my utopia and is one where you stroll towards, you know, to get your car fixed, your car mechanic talks to you about this really interesting article he or she read, right? And everyone has a conversation about things that matter to them. And there isn't this sort of weird hierarchy of, well, you know, I am just X, so I don't talk about Y, right? So intellectual work, how do we make the life of the mind, <laughs> um, as it were, right? How do we make that something that's embedded in the DNA of our everyday life, right? Of our social life. Uh, what if, for instance, the University of Chicago uh, opened up its massive research troves to everyone? I don't know. Imagine that. Um, all of that. I think intellectual life needs to be integrated into our daily lives. And also at the same time, I also want to say, you know, um, because we're also apologetic about, about being academics and being intellectuals, I also want to say this very clearly. It's perfectly okay to be obsessed with your intellectual work. It is okay, and I'm saying this especially to the women who are constantly told that they must balance life and work. It is okay to be obsessed with your career. It is okay to be obsessed with your writing. It is okay to be obsessed with your activism. There is nothing wrong with letting something take over your life, right? So I think a lot of this nonsense that we're hearing about how do you balance things and you should, you should focus more on being a good person. No, you should focus on what makes you thrive. 
right? If that means that you, as I did, right? And I, one of the things I used to love about uh, when I was in grad school, one of the things I loved doing was being one of the very few people who would be staying up till midnight in, you know, in the in Heaven Hall. And we would all, you know, you'd see these doors, and some of the doors would all be closed, and there'd be no light, and then you'd see the doors with the light under them, and you knew who was burning the midnight oil. And I loved that, and I still do it in my own way. It's okay to be that way. There's no perfect way, right, to be an academic or an activist either. Um, so, I mean, I think the question for all of us is not, you know, can we do academic, academia and activism? And the question for all of us has to be, how do we survive? academia, how do we survive activism, right? So I think hopefully we can talk about survival strategies and the importance of all that. Thank you. Uh, thanks. thanks to both of you. Um, um, I, I have a few questions. Um, and uh, the first one I want to ask has to do with um, this uh, um, I, Adam, you said in, in your in your opening statement that the classroom is a political space, uh, that, you have, that you as a teacher and well, that people enter this space with political responsibilities, but that does not necessarily make it an activist space. And then, um, and I, I thought this was somehow so. so I, I want to put that on put that on one side. So, so um, this idea that um, in some ways going back to you know the, the kind of accordance with the two of you that my teaching is not my activism. Right. This idea that activism has a kind of distinct modality is, is a specific kind of action, and that the classroom, as it exists right now, cannot cannot accommodate this space. So I want to keep that idea on the one side. And then Yasmin, from what you said, what was really interesting to me was how you were talking about like we can't think about this question of academia and activism without thinking about the distribution of power, particularly the gender distribution of power within you know our learning spaces, which we, which might include our our classrooms. Right. So there's this idea that there is um, this. That, there, that there's a problem that we have to, to, to solve almost before we get to the question of, of activism, it almost seems like. And that's something that I think uh, kind of emerged from both of what you were saying. And so my question is, um, you know, is, is, there a, is there a kind of, is, is there a way in which, uh, especially because Yasmin, you ended with um, a, a, kind of, a kind of wonderful litany of codes of conduct, right? things that we can do, kind of like moral codes, like things that you could do not, to not be a shitty person. Um, so is there a way in which, um, that in itself can be a form of activism, mm -hmm. or or is there something about this thing that we're calling activism right now that is kind of you know that that remains autonomous? And if so, you know, can we talk a little bit more about that? Like what what if if, if activism if if activism nonetheless still cannot enter into our classroom spaces right now? If it's something more than just being a responsible pedagogue, um, if it's something more than just being uh, being uh, being attend showing up for your students, attending attending to power structures stuff like that. Then what is it about activism the way we're using it right now that you know that, that makes it active that that defines it as this kind of autonomous realm? I mean, I guess I just think so. It's interesting. I mean, I know the framing is activism, but I don't really. I've never thought of myself really as an activist. I think of myself at, at various moments. I've been involved in organizing projects and. And for me, the, I guess, I think, well, I'll say what I think organizing is, and I think this is what politics is, or like political projects, political movements are collective projects that people enter and engage in with each other to, to build a particular kind of world together. And so, um, so, and so in various moments and at various times, I've been involved in those kinds of projects. Um, um, and I guess what I, so I think that like the collective part of it is really important to me as uh, how are we deciding together, uh, you know, what, what we want our world to look like and how we're going to get there. So that for me is what organizing or what a political project means. Um, and I just, I, I, I hesitate to say that like the decisions I make individually <laughs> without community, without others, is our political decisions. I mean, they may be ethical decisions, right? Like I might have a moral compass ind independently or out of the like ways I grew up or whatever that inform how I decide to live my life on a daily basis. But there is, I, and I may feel accountable to myself in that process, but, but what it means to do something with other people is to be accountable to those other people, to show up at a meeting and to be asked, well, what did you do today, right? Or how did you carry out this particular thing? And so, 
and I think that there are spaces in the academy in, within you know scholarly communities that that kind of work can happen. Um, so. You know, I mentioned union politics as one version of that on campuses. Um, uh, with colleagues, with Kathy Cohen and a few other academics, um, I'm involved in this group called Scholars for Social Justice that tries to think about how academics might intervene in certain kinds of decisions and what a political project of social justice on, at a university might look like, right? And those are different because, um, because it's not me independently deciding, like, I'm going to follow this particular pedagogical project in my classroom. It's really important for me to include these set of thinkers. And I'm not saying those are not important decisions, right? But it's about me entering a room with other people who we share maybe some basis of commonality about our critique of the academy or our particular vision of the world, and us deciding together how we might do that. And I think that's it's much more difficult, actually, than deciding you know, I can decide whatever I want to teach <laughs> on my own, right? Right, and and how I want to teach it. But but having to do that with having to do that work with other people is it's it can be difficult. It can be frustrating. But it's it's the only way transformation, institutional and political transformation, happens. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I also think activism is about sort of the long haul, which is not how it's recognized now. I think especially with yeah, quote unquote radical academic discourse and all this business of everyone wanting Anjanazi, right, on their campus. Um, those sorts of things look, I think to a lot of people, look attractive. There's more than a little bit of a macho macho thing going on there, right? And that looks, that's easy. But the sort of activism I'm really interested in is the kind of activism that actually takes years to even show up. So I'm thinking about, in terms of organizations, I think about Chicago Freedom School, shameless plug here. But uh, Chicago Freedom School, uh, you know, is a youth organization, and what they do is their work actually takes about ten to twelve years sometimes to show up, because they take people, they work with people who are, say, for instance, you know, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and they work with them. And a lot of people you see, for instance, in groups like BLM and Black Youth Project are actually graduates of Chicago Freedom School, and they take that very seriously that you invest money and time and resources in slowly talking to people over a period of time. And that's not sexy for a lot of funders, right? But that is a certain kind of activism that really is for the long haul. And then you have people like Mariam Kaba, um, who is now in New York, uh, but she's a prison abolitionist. Uh, Mariam's work is very similar. You know, Mariam does these really long, hard projects which involve bringing together histories, right, of, for instance, black radical activists, women on this outside which no one has, might have known about at all. And she puts together uh, exhibitions, she puts together panels, she puts together uh, recently a book, right? But that is, again, it's, it's a long, slow haul, and it's about something that isn't really sexy, but it takes time. So I think in terms of thinking about activism, what we're forgetting at this particular moment in time is how much time things make, which in a, in a sense, right, is very much about what pedagogy is about. My father was a teacher. Uh, it's one of the rare times that I'll talk about my father. My father, before he became a capitalist, was a teacher. And uh, <laughs> he was a school principal. And I met one of his former students when I was about 10 or something. And the student was now, you know, in his like, maybe early 30s, had a child, and came up to me afterwards. And he was reconnecting with my father. And he came up to me one day after, after dinner one day and said, you know, I just want you to know, when, I, when your father was my principal, I hated him. He was such an asshole. Uh, but everything that he taught me remains with me to this day. So I think pedagogy, when we teach, right, in classrooms, a lot of us don't, again, I think there's also a turn towards sexy, hot pedagogy, right? How can you teach this amazing text and come up with this fabulous project at the end of it that looks so amazing, fantastic, blah, 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 and that is, but pedagogy, real pedagogy, right, takes, again, a long time. It's a long time before you figure out that, that horrible asshole, right, in eighth grade, uh, what he really taught you, for instance. So um, the long, slow process, I think, is something we want to think about. I mean, I want, so I, I, I wonder if, I, could, I want to push you up a bit on this. Sure. Um, because I feel like, you know, in the, in the Center for Teaching, in the Charles Center for Teaching, you know, we're all about, like, student-centered learning and, and all about making, making the classroom more dialogic. So these are kind of, in some ways, these are like hot key terms that are floating about in neoliberal institutions, um, totally appropriated from texts like Paulo Ferry's 
that it might just be a press and stuff like that. Um, so at the same time as I understand how that that has been part of kind of a, a that had that kind of the rise of that kind of rhetoric has been contributing to kind of what people might identify as like the new, like the corporatization of the university, the kind of instrumentalization and quantification of this specific like uh, especially like humanities and social science courses, trying to make everything kind of feed into a vocational training stuff like that. So on the one hand I appreciate that, but also on the other hand, um, part of me really does believe in in the kind of effectiveness of, of that kind of uh, vocabulary and approach to teaching, right? Like I enter into a classroom and I really do want to make this a more of a dialogic space. Uh, at the same time as I acknowledge the kind of uh, distributions of power and the hierarchies that exist, I'm also, as a you know, as, as kind of the utopian academic myself, always trying to figure out like what is the what is the smaller big thing that I can do to kind of remake remake this space, right? And so that so that the pedagogy that happens in the university classroom actually does does end up being contributing to the kind of longer term thing. So I'm wondering if if you if either of you see any or practice or can envision any practices. Um, pedagogical practices within higher, ed higher education classrooms that, that can kind of shift the classroom from being just a mere space of, of exemplifying existing political constellation to, to like a place where this kind of work of, of the kind of long burn of changing the world, um, the kind of things that we, we associate with, with activism, where that can actually happen. If, if you think that is, if you see that as a possibility or I mean, I guess I would say, so I think probably a lot of us are here because we had precisely those moments of transformation in the classroom, right? Like I, I talked about reading The Vocation of the Black Scholar, which I read in an African American Studies class and being like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. So I don't, th I don't think what I'm saying is that it's not a space of transformation. And, um, and like, you know, I think thinking collectively as, as teachers about what kinds of, you know, learning from each other about how best to structure the classroom to make that possible for as many students as possible is really important. But I think, you know, all I, I think all I'm trying to say is that to, um, to focus only on that without thinking, say, for instance, like the students who end up in our classrooms here um, pay, you know, tuition is over $60,000 are heavily indebted, right, and or, or are likely to be heavily indebted when they come out of here. Um, the conditions of those of us who are doing the teaching, right, whether it's a graduate student or a, a, a tenure track professor or an adjunct, or that that those kind of, that I'm able to do that in a way that maybe others can't do that in the same way. So I think what I'm saying is that. Yes, in the context that we inhabit, there are ways to design our classrooms to, to do the best work for us, to create the best learning experience for our students. But what I'm saying is that as long as the kind of political economy of the university remains what it is, like that is a, it's a partial answer to the problem, right? And so what I think we should also be engaged in, insofar as we're interested in creating those spaces of learning for our students, uh, we have to also be interrogating and pushing back and rethinking what the university has become. All right. And I think for me, you know, as someone who's been who had been an adjunct for three years, right, I mean, gender was a huge deal and so was adjunctification. So when it came to gender, students inevitably expected the mothering role. That that's just something that happens, I think, to everyone, even those who are not adjuncts. So there's a problem with gender where already women in the classroom are automatically expected to take on a bigger nurturing role of, you know. I had one student say, well, why can't I call you at any time when my professor, you know, does? And I said, because he's a male professor and his wife is cooking for him. <laughs> my cat is waiting for me. <laughs> this, is not, uh, this is not possible. No, you can't call me at any time. So there was that, that, there was that issue. There's also the fact that for adjuncts, right, getting good evaluations depends upon, for instance, uh, being there all the time and so on. So there are those sort of institutional dynamics of power, uh, gender, all of that, that also play into it. I mean, ideally, you know, ideally, the ironic thing about the adjunct uh, organizing movement is that we should actually be organizing to have no more adjuncts. <laughs> Right? But we're in a situation much like the situation with DACA, where we're organizing to uphold and maintain and even increase a really horrible system. Uh, so that's the irony, I guess. Um, actually, I think I should op we should open it up to the audience members. And anyone has any questions or 
thoughts. Um, okay. Um, thank you both. This is great. Um, I guess I, my question comes from wondering about activism not necessarily being a left-wing category. Um, and it seems to me that in the last couple of years, like uh, right-wing activism has heavily universities either as places where the ruling class children are inculcated with ideology or just places where uh, media discourse you know is projected from and so like seeing the university as a major site for shifting um, what's that thing the Overton window it's a, a normalization of, of uh, previously unacceptable discourse um, so that seems to me like a concerted campaign, and there are you know distinct instances we can look at just on this campus, um, which has played a particular role in in that campaign over the course of the last couple of years. And so that, to me, I think of that as like a right wing activist project of like we need to educate and make the classroom a space for disseminating our point of view and fighting back against the PC culture of the university. So if that, if we count that as activism, um, then what, um, how do we answer the title question of the event um, as, like, if I am on the left, so if I'm a left-wing teacher, how do I answer the question um, knowing that there's a much more organized effort coming from a different political wing to make <coughs> Um, that's a, it's a really good question, I think. And, um, you know, so I think one of the things, this isn't a total, this will be a partial answer to the question, but I think one of the things is to unmask the neutrality by which the university presents itself, right? So it's never the case, actually. The, the narrative on the right is like, the university is this bastion of liberal left thinking that endorses, you know, PC and all of these things. And the university, and particularly this one, has been invested in saying, you know, has so has kind of doubled down on a certain kind of, you know, neutral, neutral language of neutrality. We believe in freedom of speech. All ideas can be heard and and understood and taken up here, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think one thing we have to do collectively is unmask that that language of neutrality and the idea that the university functions as a free marketplace of ideas, because there is no free marketplace <laughs> of anything, but and certainly at a university, <laughs> there is no kind of equal access kind of situation. And so I think part of that, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that um, part of our, our, our kind of res responsibility in this case is to speak back to the kind of administrative power or the university uh, hi hierarchy that holds in place the, the, the kind of uh, ideological mask that obscures precisely what you're talking about, right? Um, as just as a first step, at least, to kind of combating that. Yeah, I don't have a, a very good answer because I'm still trying to think about how to think about ideological, I agree with everything you know, said, and I agree with what you said about what is happening. I don't, I haven't quite figured out how to get a conversation or some clarity about what ideological ramifications mean and for whom, right? So just to kind of make it a little bit more concrete, I was in a discussion with a friend of mine about The Handmaid's Tale. Um, the new one, and the actually we were talking about all the different versions. There's a book, there's a you know right, there's a movie, and there's a TV show. And she said something which I thought was just incredibly powerful and astute. She said, you know, because we were talking about dystopias, and we were saying, oh, you know, this is a dystopia, blah blah blah. And she said, you know, for a lot of people, that is a utopia. So how, you know, so as a pedagogue or a teacher or an activist, you know. What is the conversation I'm supposed to have, right? Uh, where I, uh, that is a utopia for a lot of people. And so is the idea of the free market, you know, blah, blah, blah. So the, I, one of the things we can do, of course, is to say, well, free for whom, right? What is a free market? We can question that, we can interrogate it, and we should. And of course, there are things that we can and should take for granted, which is, you know, uh, slavery was a horrible thing, racism is bad, sexism is terrible. No, you don't 
get to do this to women, etc., etc. And you can say that. But then when you start to start to pick away at all of that, then you start to look at, say, immigration, right? And you say, well, okay, so, but who's defining the conversation on immigration? So for me, for instance, the immigration conversation right now is being held, as far as I'm concerned, is being held entirely by right-wingers, posing as left-wingers. They're all looking for the status quo. I have absolutely no skin in this game. You know, and it's a very difficult position for me to be in because I'm like, this is a horrible agenda, right? So, so I think I haven't got a satisfactory answer because I haven't quite figured out how to deal uh, with the painfulness for me for all of that. I can say, yes, this is bad. This part of your ideology is terrible. This is right wing. I can identify this is right wing. But then when I start to think about more closely about Say, for instance, gay marriage, you know, against equality was actually literally barred from universities. We are a left-wing queer radical group. We were told by gay people we couldn't enter because we were, you know, we were just not allowed to enter. Uh, so there's that, you know, we were caught, we didn't know how to discuss us, so they just sort of slammed us, right? So, so I just, I have a, I have a, I'm really hesitating around how to negotiate this business of what is left and what is right, how to even have a conversation. Sam's question. So as you're talking, one thing I'm thinking is that um, being good pedagogues um, in some ways is, is it's important, but it's also just harm reduction. It's making it easier for our students to survive, um, to pick up what Yasmin was saying. Um, and then when we're teaching content that perhaps is, is radicalizing or you know has important effects, in a sense, what we're doing there is raising awareness so that our students hopefully will go out and do activism, right? Um, and so I guess a question for me is, uh, I think what, uh, and I, you know, just, you know, thank you. Um, but you know, what you pointed out so well is that, uh, you know, the, the work of creating the new world, uh, or that the world that we want is, is, is something we need to do. We can't just hope that our students learn something in our classes and then they go do the work. But then why is it that on the right, the idea of kind of consciousness raising and, and ideological uh, dissemination is seen as so effective and is being so effective. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if this question makes sense, but I'm, I'm just saying, like, oh, if, if, if the two things we might offer, good pedagogy and, like, um, necessary content, are not enough for us, why are they perhaps enough uh, for the right? Which doesn't respond to what you were pointing out, Yasmin, about like, even dividing these two things. These are good questions. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess, I think what I'm saying is that, like, just to reiterate, I think, like, good pedagogy and content is not enough, actually. Right. Like, we all, you know, I think it's a different thing when our students hopefully see us also modeling the kinds of politics we, we ourselves inhabit. So that's one thing. I mean, the other thing is, I think, you know, it's hard because currently we're losing, or our side is losing, right? So we're on the, on the side of challenging power. I mean, this is, and so I think it's, you know, if, yeah, it's, it's easier for the dominant side, right? And in part because it also, again, I think the presentation of itself as neutral, as universal, as um, leg legitimate, etc. Like, I mean, it's a that's that's what we're up against in some sense. And I think, um, yeah. So I guess that's what I would say. I mean, I I don't know. Again, this is not totally um, satisfactory, probably, but. But I think it's it's always going to be the those who are challenging power that that side has a uphill battle, right? And and I think it's important. Also, I was I was having this conversation with a friend of mine this weekend. I mean, in some ways, it's a, a moment uh, both in the academic context and in the in the country more broadly a moment of deep. It could be a moment of deep pessimism, right, Off from the perspective of the left. But it's, it's important to, I think, note that like we may be far away from the world we want, but the, our opponents haven't also fully realized the world they want. Like, they probably want Handmaid's Tale or something. <laughs> like, that's their, utop that's their utopia. So I think there's a, you know, there's a ton of room of possibility. Like, and so I think it's important to not feel like this is just a moment of closure. I mean, I may have at some point, but at this point, I'm, my interest is not 
in getting students to go out and change the world in the sure. way I want to see it, <laughs> right? My interest is in, uh, is in sort of, I, maybe it's, it's become a lot more abstract over the years where I want people to figure out how to think about something, whether that means that someone will then go along emboldened in their, what I might see as a conservative view of the world or not, right? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't have a good answer because I'm really thinking about how, okay, where do I, how do I want to see, I obviously want to change, see change in the world from a left perspective, yes. And how do I do work that does that? <coughs> would I be doing that if I were put back into a classroom today, right? Uh, would I do, now if I'm asked to do a workshop on immigration rights for CFS, for instance, right? Obviously, that's a very different perspective. That's sort of an activist left pedagogical model right there. There I know, okay, this is what you need. These are the tools you need. Here's the card, here's et cetera, et cetera. In a classroom, I don't know. Um, I don't think there's any such thing as a pure, you know, there's no purity of ideology, or there's no purity of text, right. thought, et cetera. But I have a really hard time, and I've been there, right? I've been the person who's gone and <coughs> had very, for instance, anti-war politics, et cetera. Uh, but I, I don't know, I have a hard time with thinking that what I want my students to be is X. I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah. And I will also just say that, you know, during the Obama years, none of this was a, this was a primary problem. Dude was, I mean, this is the obvious thing to say, but dude was droning shit out of people and joking about it, right? And I watched the dissolution. I remember being on Lakeshore Drive and you shut it down for an anti-war protest. And I also remember the silence during the Obama years. So I'm having a much harder time with this with the business of left and right, etc. Mm -hmm. But great questions, thank you. <laughs> um, so Adam, we talked a little bit about um, UChicago as an institution, or institutions in general, and their space in the cities and communities that they're in. So would you mind talking, or either of you, about the, the community and the institution's role it's had in the community, and, and how you might envision that? Um, changing or um, yeah how you would ideally see that relationship um, yes so I'll give a, a couple of you know examples from both the Yale experience which kind of <laughs> very similar to the Chicago experience um, but I think you know I mean this is so there's a variety of ways to think about like what it means to be very wealthy institutions um, in context of just you know, horrifying racial inequality and, and domination and, and the kinds of, you know, relationships that institutions have with, with these spaces. So, for instance, um, you know, at Yale, um, the, and, and especially the tax exempt status of these un universities and the ways that that might reproduce kind of those very inequalities. So, for instance, at Yale, if Yale paid property taxes, um, it would be $80 million that would go to the city of, of New Haven, right? Um, they have a payment in lieu of taxes system where they pay $8 million to the city of, of New Haven. And so, I mean, and so on the one hand, okay, $8 million is better than no, none, but I think like, I mean, I guess, so one kind of project that came out of the Yale unions um, uh, in, in, in New Haven was to demand, this was right after I left, was to, but to, to, to kind of try to pass legislation at the state level that would ch ch change Yale's tax exempt status. They wouldn't pay $80 million, but they would be required by law to pay more than that. So that's just one version of kind of, I mean, you know, th rethinking the relationship between you t you, the university and the city. I mean, the other in both cities, both here and, um, and Yale was uh, policing, right, and the role of university police vis-a-vis -vis, uh, communities, and I mean, and and the ways students of color <laughs> get entrapped in those in those relations, right? Who always get read as outside uh, outsiders, um, and we saw like the horrifying consequences of that just a, you know a few a month ago, I guess now. Um, so. So I think, I mean, I don't have kind of total, like, at, like we should do, this is the program, but I think like for those of us who inhabit the university who are interested in, um, you know, transforming that relationship, there, there are a bunch of activist groups and organizers on the South Side who have 
a long history of challenging the university, right? So mm -hmm. the fight around the trauma center, the successful mm -hmm. fight around the trauma center being kind of an exemplary model mm -hmm. of that. So I think it's about kind of how do we as kind of ins insiders mm -hmm. who have a critical relationship to the university form kind of those horizontal relationships mm -hmm. between community members who, who have been doing the work of pushing back mm -hmm. against the institution. Yeah, and resources, you know, opening up university's resources is one thing. Even something as simple as transportation. I did not know until a three, about three months ago that, I keep calling it a trolley, but it's not a trolley. It's a, what is it? The shuttle. But, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the shuttle. Um, the shuttle is actually, technically, apparently, can be used by people in the neighborhood without paying. It has to do with something around the way it was funded as a university community um, uh, program. So mm -hmm. technically, I'm supposed to be able to get on the, the, the shuttle at any point in time and be able to go anywhere in the neighborhood. But they make it seem like mm -hmm. you can't use it without an ID. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's that. There's something as simple as you know, transportation and how the university occludes knowledge, right? Yeah. Occludes information. And then there's the question of, of course, you know, resources like library resources, mm -hmm. thinking about uh, intellectual work is more spread out. But also uh, working, you know, CSU, Chicago State University, is the only four year South Side University. On, on this, it, it, in this area, and that is, you know, it's hard to figure out what's happening. It's probably going to disappear. If the University of Chicago would be more of a, of a collegial institution that actually believed in higher education, it would work with CSU, right, instead of letting it possibly disappear, or becoming another UIC. UIC used to be uh, first generation college campus, etc., and now it's trying to become more like the University of Chicago. So, and the, the problem there is just, I think, with how higher education is configured in the United States as mm -hmm. literally higher education for some, mm -hmm. um, you know, less than less than edu higher education for others. So, there's just some of the ways, but I don't know how to do it, especially with this university, which is particularly monstrous. Mm -hmm. I mean, all universities are. I went to Purdue, which is a land grant, extremely wealthy. Again, people don't know how much money a land grant university can have, but also similarly grabs a lot of land literally around uh, the university. And then there's a whole town, uh, town gown distinction, etc. So there are class issues there, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to race. At a place like Purdue, in, in where it is, it's about class divisions, mm -hmm. right? And that's a whole other set of issues. I think we'll take one final question. Get in the back. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to what the current moment in America has done to, you know, with Trump, of also sort of turning everybody's gaze, American's gaze, inward. You know, it's, it's almost as if, um, because I guess activism is a more kind of local response, does teaching become that space where you can again sort of make people realize because that there is a world out there and that it's Amer you know that American students have to I, I'm surprised how much how little is known of what's going on mm -hmm. because there is this kind of obsessive concern about mm -hmm. what's happening to America right now. Mm -hmm. So if you could sort of speak to how one keeps those global and local and national responses at, at the same time. I mean, I guess I would just say, um, in, in terms, again, of thinking about the university's function, so I just talked about this kind of expropriative relationship to local communities, but I think one can think about similarly expropriative relationships that universities have vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So, um, you know, mm -hmm. there's all this kind of, um, um, new research or new journalism that's showing the relationship of university endowments and say uh, what's going on in Puerto Rico, right? And or what happened in Argentina with their sovereign wealth fund, right? So so I think, again, I think in the classroom space, right, um, for me especially, I, all my classes are about race and imperialism. So I'm constantly thinking, and my work is about that, so thinking about the world beyond America and the ways in which America um, uh, relates as an imperial project to the rest of the world. But I think even when we think about our activism or our organizing in relationship to the university, 
especially in a moment where the university is deeply invested in, the, in itself as a global yeah. project, right? Mm -hmm. In a global meaning a variety of things, having satellite campuses in various mm -hmm. parts of the world, presenting itself to a kind of you know international elite as this as a space of learning. Um, and and then it's kind of, you know, like very untransparent process of investment and endowment uh, and profit generation through endowments. Like all of these are kind of ways in which it's 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 kind of embedded in the project of American empire as a global project. And I think the I agree with you, there's a way in which um, in this moment, like the local has become the site of a kind of imaginings of alternatives, but I think if we learn again from activists and organizers, uh, especially in Chicago, but el everywhere else, they've always managed to make that jump, right? Mm -hmm. like, like say something like We Charge Genocide was an attempt to kind of leverage the international in the context of a kind of particular local struggle about police brutality. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about like, thinking at those levels, I think that we can learn from um, organizers. And also, I think just constantly thinking about, this is where a lot of academics aren't able to do the work or don't want to do the work, which is to push at a project which really reveals in very transparent ways the ways in which university capital, right, literally is embedded in global capitalism. I'm thinking about the NYU, I'm thinking about, yeah, um, uh, yeah and I'm thinking about, uh, what's his name, his research at NYU, um, Andrew Ross's, yeah. thank you. Andrew Ross's sort of, which is investigate, which is sort of a combination of investigative journalism and mm -hmm. academic analysis, and also just on the ground work, where right? he was actually prohibited uh, from entering, I think, Dubai at one point. But the ways in which academics, ha because of the sorts of links that they can provide, right, and, then, and also the ways in which activists in countries can also provide right, information, um, there, there is a way, real way, if, if we did it right, Right? If we did it right, academics and quote unquote non academics could really shatter a lot of the structures that we see literally going up around us, um, mm -hmm. just in terms of even buildings, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But if we would to think about what does that mean? Right? What, kind of, um, what kind of labor is getting exploited? What, is, what does it mean for NYU? What does it mean for the UFC? All these places to have satellite campuses in incredibly oppressive uh, regimes, for instance, etc. It, to me, the, the problem, I think, in, in, in America, <laughs> it sounds so, uh, uh, just such a broad statement, right? But what I've always been struck by about the United States, if I may say so, it's sort of profound anti-intellectualism. And this is something I don't understand, uh, coming from a place where, uh, you know, uh, illiterate people, people who can't read, sit around a tree in the morning and listen to someone read the newspaper out to them. I'm from Calcutta or India originally. So this profound sort of lack of awareness is embedded in something else that peculiar, that seems to be particularly American, but it's also unfortunately being exported. So I, and that's not to fetishize, you know, oh, we do it so much better in the East. That I, I don't mean to replicate that crap either, but difficult questions and difficult mm -hmm. strategies are out. Well, let's thank Ilana Yasmin.